What's cracking, big dopes? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to HQ. I'm Nicholas. That is Noah at FBGod on Twitter. Week one is officially in the novels, so we have a lot to take away. And I want to address one thing right off the bat. I know I'm getting a lot of messages and a lot of DMs and whatnot asking if I'm okay. They haven't seen any YouTube videos go up over the last couple of days. The in-season content schedule. People are like, you know, you, you can't not post anything in season after a thousand thousands of people, you know, took your advice for drafting teams and shit, and then you just disappear on us. We didn't disappear, guys. We're right here. We bike, all right? In-season schedule. Wednesday through Sunday, you will get videos on YouTube. Tuesday is going to be the waiver wire article, which is exclusive to Patreon. We will not be doing a waiver wire video. It's only an article which will give you a position-by-position position breakdown of the top pickups, how much fab we would spend on each guy, whether or not we'd use a number one waiver wire, waiver wire priority on the player. Um, all that's on Patreon. So that is in-season schedule. Wednesday through Sunday, you will be getting video content on the channel. We are not going anywhere. Let's talk about week one. Now, the biggest thing to take away from week one is obviously not to overreact with a one-game sample size because you could take a one-game sample size of any week and you will get – spit out a different group of top 10 players or top five players, depending on the position. So we don't go crazy, but it's also important not to underreact because there are a lot of takeaways that you have to put into context and decide where you want to go from there. You have to pivot off some players. There are a lot of players that I didn't like that performed very well in week one. There's a lot of players that I like that didn't perform very well and vice versa. Same thing with you guys. It's something that we say all the time. You want to diversify the players on your team because you're going to be wrong about a lot of shit. And if you listen to me, I'm going to be wrong about a lot of shit. But as long as you diversify, you'll be fine. You'll get some good players here, some bad players here, and we will help you throughout the season to hopefully put together a winning squad. Last thing I want to address, if you're going to go back to one of our videos from like a month and a half ago or two months ago and be like, well, this didn't age well. One, I'm all for the shit talking. I totally understand because I'm going to get a bunch of shit wrong. But at least like be original or funny. Like that's not funny anymore going back and be like, that didn't age well. So if you're going to do that, we're fine with it. Just be fucking funny. Just be yeah, funny. That's why I'm taking my victory laps right now because when those start surfacing and like Matt Stafford breaks his back next week, I'm just going to go into hiding and I'm not going to respond to any of those. Yeah, I'm already fucking in hiding with the number of <laughs> things I'm getting about Josh Jacobs who ran for like 80 yards on 23 carries. Like I would hope a fucking running back can run for 80 yards. And anyway, we're not going to get into him. We're just going to talk about trade targets for each week. Every Wednesday, we're going to get on here and talk about some buy low, some sell high candidates. Last week, the first edition before the actual season kickoff, we basically went into some of the top trade targets that you're looking for in the beginning of the season. We didn't just look for week one. We talked about the first month of the season, and I want to go back and kind of revisit the guys that we had talked about as sell high, trade low, buy low candidates. First guy on this list was Aaron Jones, and we talked about him as a buy low candidate because we are like, he has a very hard schedule. Then what we saw was he got destroyed by the Bears. They let him put up like five fantasy points. However, when you break down the game into context, one, that's a ridiculously tough matchup. They're in Chicago. Aaron Jones still saw nearly a 70% opportunity share um, in that backfield. So Jamal Williams definitely played, but not anywhere near to the point where I'm concerned about Aaron Jones' workload moving forward. The Packers are going to have much better days, so he is still a very good buy-low candidate. Miles Sanders, we said the same thing. We were like, you know what, I hope he plays around 50% of the snaps week one, 55, 60, and that's exactly what happened. He played 48% of the snaps. He led the backfield in opportunities, in touches and in snaps. So that's what you want to see. He did not put up a big box score number. He got a really, really beautiful touchdown run, like a 21 or 22-yard touchdown run called back from holding. So he could have had a much bigger day. We also saw him get plenty of carries inside the 10-yard line, inside the five-yard line. So that was good to see. He will continue to be another good buy-low candidate. So we hit on those guys. Cooper Cup. Um, I thought that he was going to be slowly eased into the lineup, despite all the reports of him looking good throughout the preseason. Here's what we saw. The offense played on 76 snaps. Robert Woods was in on 72 of them, Brandon Cooks on 70 of them, and Cooper Cup on 68 of them. So they were all 89% for Cup and above for Cooks and Woods. It looks like they're going to continue to do that three-headed wide receiver monster attack, four wide receivers um, throughout their offense. So it looks like Coop, uh, Cooper Cup is a full-time player right out of the gate. We'll see if that continues. We'll see if they, they make any adjustments based on the game against the Panthers, and they kind of struggled on the ground. Um, well, they, they struggled to give Gurley volume on the ground. They're switching back and forth with the, with the backfield, whatever. Um, so Cooper Cup seems like a guy that maybe you won't be able to buy low because he played a lot, but he didn't put up a big uh, stat line. Now we had Marlon Mack as a sell high because the early season schedule dictated him to have good game flow and get a lot of carries, and that's what we saw in week one. Now he went off in week one. Uh, I'm not sure if we would 
continue to put him on the buy, uh, buy or sell high list because he looks so damn good. Um, but maybe we will retouch that. We also had Alshon Jeffrey, and we saw him um, get in the end zone, so it kind of saved his fantasy day. We had him as a sell-high guy, which fit our narrative because he was third in the team in targets behind Deshaun Jackson. Zach Ertz, who saw a much higher percentage in terms of target share in the first week. So Alshon Jeffrey still looks like a good sell-high candidate um, because he was saved by the touchdown, and I'm sure that will happen a few more times, so there will be plenty of windows to do so. So we were pretty accurate on our first assessment of guys that we will be looking to sell high, buy low, Let's jump into week one, Mr. FB God. Who are we trading for? Who are we trading away? All right, a buy low. That's actually not really a buy low because – Wait, 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 wait. Hit the intro. You're going to do that to me? <laughs> After fucking George flexed on me in the comments, I had to get you back. <laughs> All right, we're going to start with Damian Williams, who before I was rudely cut off by my, by my co-host who runs this channel can just fire me in two seconds. Um, <laughs> Damian Williams running back for the Kansas City Chiefs. A lot of people are trying to sell him high right now. And I think because of that, you have to buy him low because people, their vision of him as a sell high is too low of a value for you to pass up on. Because I was getting like messages and DMs and you could see on Twitter that people were getting Damian Williams in the sixth and seventh round after LaShawn McCoy got there. And the fact that he was already that low valued and now that LaShawn McCoy looked good in week one and people are like afraid that he's going to take over this job and they want to sell Williams high because he had like a good fantasy production day despite not being very efficient. I think that's a good time to buy because you look at how he was used and like how often and where he was used. He had 19 touches. He outsnapped McCoy 45 to 20. And keep in mind, they were playing the Jacksonville Jaguars, who even though Patrick Mahomes made them look like a high school defense, like they're still one of the better defenses in the league. So that's not something to scoff at, that the guy had 19 touches, six of them being catches. And they were using him on the goal line in the passing game. There was one that was called back by penalty, and Mahomes overthrew it anyways. But it was like a beautiful play right up the seam, and he just burnt the guy that was on him because he's a, mis he's a mismatch for other linebackers that are too slow to guard him. And I think the people selling him right now aren't realizing the value that a guy a running back in the Chiefs offense, despite playing, even if he gets like 60% of the snaps, I'll take 14 touches on the Chiefs offense over like 18 touches on the Jaguars offense any day of the week. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm necessarily looking to buy Damian Williams, but if I have him on my team, I'm not panicking because Shady, you know, played well on like a yards per carry basis or whatever you want to, you know, justify the statistics. The, the, fatter, uh, the, the thing that matters here is that they even wanted 19 fucking touches. It was like the quietest 19 touches you'll hear from a running back it's because he didn't put up any numbers on the ground. But the guy had, what was it, six catches? Yeah. Yeah, he's very involved in his passing game. And this is obviously a passing game that just lost Tyree Kill. So they're going to have to get their playmakers the ball in space and figure out other ways to move the ball downfield. I don't think Patrick Mahomes will have a problem as long as he keeps his eyes on the fucking target he's throwing. <laughs> Did you see that video of him throwing uh, Travis Kelsey? Yeah, he, like, apologized about it, too. He's like, hey, man, I'm going to get you back. And Kelsey's like, nah, you're good, man. Like, he better Dude, be good. He threw 50 touchdowns last year. I was fucking dying when they showed the replay. It was like <laughs> Travis Kelsey was so wide open, there was no reason. <laughs> for Patrick Mahomes to be looking. He was, like, looking at the goalpost. He's, like, he's not kicking a field goal. Just throw it to him. Yeah, and then he fucking way overthrows Travis Kelsey. But um, the point is, right, Damian Williams was very close to having two touchdowns in this game, very involved in the passing game. Sure, LaShawn McCoy will get some carries. Um, but, like, what, what made us so excited about Damian Williams in the first place was the fact that he's going to get a lot of touchdowns. This is an offense that's going to score so many points, and he's going to be the main beneficiary from this, right? We're already seeing in the first game. He's the guy on the goal line. He's the guy getting the receiving work. Um, so he's getting the valuable touches in the offense that is going to have a lot of valuable touches for the running back. So I would hold steady with Damian Williams. Uh, Noah likes to, to buy him. I don't know if I'm as confident knowing that Lash LaShawn McCoy got that much work. Um, I'm, but not, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily buying him to buy him. I'm buying him if somebody's selling him at a price that you know is lower than what he should be valued at, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I get that. Another guy that I feel like kind of fits into that category for me coming off a miserable, miserable week one is Sony Michelle. He was going a little bit later in drafts this year. I want to say like the fifth round of most of the drafts that I ended up um, drafting in. And what happens if, if you're a fifth round pick and you have a really shitty week one or two, a lot of the times you fall down the rankings really, really dramatically. And that's what happened with Sony Michelle in week one. They went against Pittsburgh. He carried the ball 
14 times for 15 yards, or it might have been vice versa, 15 times for 14 yards, something, something really, really, really fucking miserable. However, Pittsburgh's run defense is really, really, really underrated and really good. So, yeah, can I speak to that for a second? Yeah. You know how Austin be gone. It might be a little off topic, but remember how everybody was talking about how like Austin Eckler couldn't handle a workload, and then this past Sunday we saw just how good he was? Mm-hmm. One of the defenses that people were using as an argument against Eckler last year, he started three games without Gordon. One was Tennessee, who we just saw was awesome. One was Cincinnati, where he did do well, and the other one was Pittsburgh. It should be no surprise that – I know this is kind of an argument for Austin Eckler, but like Pittsburgh is a very good and legitimate run defense, and you shouldn't be selling – Sony Michelle just because he had a poor game where they were blowing out the Steelers and they have one of the better front lines in football. Yeah, I mean, Pittsburgh's run defense is no joke. And I think people will realize that sooner rather than later. And this game just dictated that the Patriots were going to throw the ball. I think like by the time they got into, you know, the second quarter, the second half, they realized they're like, we're not going to be able to run the ball at all on this team. So we're just going to throw the ball, you know, a, a bunch of times. And that was what their, um, that was what their offense really revolved around. Now, when you look at Sonny Michelle and the rest of the matchups, I mean, they get the Dolphins now. And, like, Sonny Michelle might end up getting in the end zone between four and six times. Because yeah, I they see your have... write-up. It says Dolphins just let up about 98 points to Mark Ingram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Mark Ingram, and that's another guy who I was not high on. And people are like, oh, look what he did. I'm like, dude, first of all, Mark Ingram was splitting the carries on the first drive with Gus Edwards right off the rip. And they were going against the Dolphins. But the point about Sonny Michelle is, like, they get the Dolphins, then they get the Jets, then the Bills. Um, the Jets just let up like 28 yards per carry to Devin Singletary. Like that's not even a fucking exaggeration, which is the sick part. Um, you have the Bills who just let up a ton of yards to Le'Veon Bell as an all-purpose back. Uh, and none of these, you know, uh, uh, the point is like all of these games, Dolphins, Jets, Bills, Redskins, Jets, Browns, are all games in which the Patriots are going to be heavy, 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 heavy favorites, right? And they did end up blowing out the Steelers, but they did it through the air because they're such a good run defense. Now, Tony Michelle gets this light schedule. Um, they are 17 and a half point favorites against the Miami Dolphins in week two. This is the most they've been favored by since December 4th, 2011, when they were 20 point favorites over the Colts. So when I look at the matchups coming up, like, yes, this was a really tough game for Sony Michelle. I don't think in any circumstances you're looking to sell uh, Sony Michelle right now because of the slate that you're about to have for the next six weeks. I mean, Damian Harris, which was his, supposed to be his biggest competition going into the year, was a healthy scratch because the guy doesn't play on special teams. And clearly, that means that they think he is a full, full step behind Sony Michelle in terms of the running category. So he got no room here. Um, he did not perform well in this week one, but he's not someone that I am panicking on quite yet because he is a high end RB2, probably RB1 um, upside in. Week two, I think he probably rattles off over 100 yards from scrimmage and easily touchdown, if not multiple touchdowns, similar to a stat line that Mark Ingram had in week one. So Sonny Michelle's a guy I'm looking to get on the low. Yeah, with Sonny Michelle, there's not a lot of running backs that I want to buy in on that don't catch passes. But if there are any, it's like players on elite offenses. And that's exactly what the Patriots are, especially with Antonio Brown not coming into town. The upgrade that he's going to be over Philip Dorsett, like if he doesn't get suspended before next week, is... Like, he's going to stretch the field for them. They're going to be in scoring opportunities, and he's going to have one to two, like, goal line carries a week. I don't think that's even an exaggeration um, for this team. And, you know, that kind of supplants the fact that he's not going to see, like, 35, 40 targets on the season if he's going to be in the end zone every other week and he's going to be over 100 yards or at least near it, especially in those matchups. Um, he's going to be a guy I'm buying in on. Now, a guy who doesn't have pass-catching ability, despite what he saw last week, is Derrick Henry, Max the Animal's favorite player of all time. I, I cannot buy in on the Derrick yeah, Henry. Take his content right into my fucking veins, baby. I think people think I hate, like, Derrick Henry as, like, a person. Like, on a personal level, if I saw him in real life, I would fight I him. Would. First off, I would. Fuck you would fight him? I would fight him. I'd fucking would. We'd need a new CEO in, like, five seconds, but... <laughs> <laughs> You promise? I, I don't know. I, it, if you get attacked by Derrick Henry, he's coming for me next. So I don't want to be a part of that. He can't move like laterally, though. There's no way he'd be able to catch. That's what I'm saying, dude. That 75 yard catch was so fraudulent. He caught it in the flat, and he just ran straight. It was like animals. Just, animals like, I told you he can catch. I'm like any any running back can literally just stand there and catch a screen pass that was like directed at his fucking chest. But whatever. Let's get into let's get into some real numbers, though. Yeah, some real numbers. Um, well, the number I post on Twitter is like a little wonky because there was like a seven yard run that he had that was called back to like to a face mask but it still counted whatever either way over half of his carries went for two or less yards last week which I know that there's like some like big play guys like Saquon Barkley somebody in my mention said oh Saquon Barkley is the same way Saquon Barkley doesn't rush for like negative one yards eight times in a row like this this is a guy who is either going to run into the back of his lineman 
or find a crease once every 35 carries and take it to the house. And that's not a guy I'm going to be betting on week after week. I know like as an RB three or flex, if somehow he felt you at that range, or maybe he's a keeper. Um, of course you're going to start him there, but as an RB one and RB two in your offense, you're really banking on like big upside plays from him, which there's only a few guys in the NFL that I would really rely on those on. And either way, like a Saquon Barkley, he's going to give you something in the passing game. The other part that's not so underrated, but you got to realize is the Titans won this game by 30 points. How many games this year are they going to be up by 30 and just have the luxury to run the ball with Derrick Henry? Like you look at their schedule, right? The Colts next week, that's going to be tough. Jaguars suck. Uh, Falcons, they looked bad, but they always start a little bit slow. Uh, whatever. I'll just go to the good offenses. Like the Chargers, um, the Buccaneers will probably still be able to score, even though Jameis Winston's awful. The Panthers, the Chiefs, the Colts again, the Texans, the Saints. There's a lot of games where they're not going to be able to have that luxury of just running the ball like 30 times a game and giving Derrick Henry all these touches. I just don't see a way where he's going to return this value. And his at this point, his value is as high as I see it being this entire season because – even though they were up as much as they were last game, Deion Lewis still played 41% of the snaps. And as we saw last year, he's still the guy that's going to be on the field when they're trailing and in passing down situations. Yeah, that's that's the scary part is the fact that, like, despite having the most ridiculous game script for Derrick Henry, and he did what he should have done in a game script like this. Like, there's no doubt he put up a ton of fantasy points. And if you had him in your lineup, obviously you're fucking happy about it. But we're looking, about, we're looking at what's predictive going forward. And you see him splitting the snaps 60 to 40 with Deion Lewis in a game where um, – they should have absolutely, you know, given Derrick Henry 25 plus carries and that should have been, I mean, he should have been playing on every single down. There's no reason to put Deion Lewis in passing situation. I also think like a big reason I argued against Derrick Henry this summer was the fact that like, I don't think this offense is really, I mean, they're definitely not as good as what they showed on Sunday. Um, and from a negative standpoint, like they're not going to be putting up, you know, this many points on a week to week basis. Maybe they're definitely going to be better than I originally thought they would be, but I don't think we're going to see a lot of games that end up like this for Derrick Henry. Now, when we're looking at the snaps, it is 60-40. I'm looking at routes run by both running backs, and they both ran 10 routes in this game. So it's not like Deion Lewis actually got more passing work, although he was targeted four times compared to Derrick Henry's two targets. Um, they both only ran 10 routes on the game, which among qualified running backs was 38th. They were tied for 38th among running backs in the NFL in terms of overall routes ran. So I think like you could say, like, oh, you know what, they went very low volume on the passing game, but that's what their offense is going to probably be, you know. Um, they're not trying to throw a ton of passes. They're not having to try to have Mariota throw the ball 35, 40, 45 times a game. So if you think that like this recurring um, Derrick Henry catching the ball is going to be something that we see week over week, I think you're going to be very disappointed because he didn't get a lot of passing work. He, he took the one screen 75 yards to the house. I mean, if there's anyone that could just run in a fucking straight line really fast and not get tackled, it's Derrick Henry. But that's not something I expect to see over and over and over again. So um Derrick Henry, yeah, I'm fine selling high just because he's coming off such a, a monster game right now. Yeah, and another thing is, like, this offense looked good, but keep in mind, after that left tackle, I think Greg Robinson's his name for the Browns, went down. They sacked Baker, like, three times or four times maybe. They had three picks, a pick six, uh, a safety. Like, they were just turning the ball over so much, and I know they're an elite offense, but the fact that they were in such good field position, basically the entire game led to them putting up 43 points, and I don't think you could expect that even if they're going to be a top-five defense this year. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm cool selling Derrick Henry on the high. One guy I'm looking to buy on the low, a young wide receiver out of New York. That's Robbie, as we like to call him, Spaghetti Anderson here in the HQ. Now he came into the game kind of nursing a calf strain um, and it looked like he was fine. Maybe he was a little less than hundred percent, maybe at like 90%, but I don't think it really hampered him too much in this game. He came away with a very, really, really poor stat line. Three for seven, caught three of the seven targets for 23 yards. Uh, so he threw up a, a dud game statistically, which was unsurprising because you're going against his Bills offense, which or Bills defense, which houses Tredavious White, one of the best shadow corners in the entire NFL. So as soon as you have that kind of matchup, you know, you have to be a little bit hesitant, added in with the fact that we think he's probably nursing a calf strain. So he was an easy one to see that would probably have a, a tough week one, and that's exactly what happened. The good news, however, is that like Robbie Anderson was targeted down the field. He was a few inches away from having a, a big game. Um, and we saw that Darnold was still looking down the field to Anderson. He was throwing the ball to Crowder on a ridiculous amount of his throws, right? Crowder saw 17 fucking targets. So when Darnold starts converting some of those shorter targets down the field a little bit more, those are going to be going to, uh, you know, to, to get Anderson here. Now he finished with 23 receiving yards, but he had 121 air yards on the day. Now, if you guys are new to air yards, it's simply literally just like the, 
the yards that the ball travels when it's targeted towards that receiver, which is a predictive stat because you're getting more valuable um, long field, long ball targets, right? And that was 53% of the air yards in the New York Jets air yard market share. So 53% of the air yards on the day went to Robbie Anderson, which was the third highest percentage share for a team in the NFL in week one. Um, so Sam Darnold was under pressure all day, uh, 18 dropbacks. He was under pressure in week one, which was the sixth highest number of any quarterback on Sunday. And it's not like, you know, Anderson is still getting targeted plenty. Like seven targets is not nothing when you're a guy getting targets 30 yards down the field, right? Had he maybe caught like two of four targets for 23 yards, I'd say like uh, maybe, you know, Crowder is like the main guy here. But getting seven targets that are down the field and seeing all those air yards, those are eventually going to connect, right? We saw the chemistry throughout the preseason of Darnold and Robbie Anderson looking really good. And those games are going to come when Robbie Anderson is not shadowed by a Tredavious White or an elite cornerback in the NFL. And he's in a tough division when it comes to cornerbacks. You will see Tredavious White again. You will see Stephon Gilmore and players like that. But there will be better days for Sam Darnold. There will be days for Robbie Anderson. And right now, I feel like he's probably someone you could buy very cheap because he was already like a seventh, eighth round pick. And um, you know, him showing this inconsistency right off the bat and just the Jets offense not looking very good is a prime reason to kind of buy into what they're doing right now. Yeah, just as you said, he was under pressure all day. And that was the reason why I think it was 17 targets for Jameson Crowder. Crowder. Yeah, yeah it, it was just quick dump offs the entire day, even Le'Veon Bell out of the backfield. Um, but as you said, there were like those two deep targets it was on the same drive that Darnold looked to him. I think it was like the span of four plays. He looked. He was a little bit late on a throw, which would have been an easy walk and touch on. He had the guy beat by a couple of yards, um, and then another one. He wasn't quite as wide open, but he still had his man beat. And I know even if he's going to be facing guys like, if you look at his schedule upcoming, he gets Stephon Gilmore, then the Eagles, but then he gets Byron Jones, Stephon Gilmore again, Jalen Ramsey. After that's me like Dolphins, Giants, Redskins, a bunch of like easy matchups. The thing about him though is he has that speed where it doesn't really matter if he's being covered by like an elite cornerback. I know that might sound stupid, but we just one play, it's one play. Yeah. It's, it's like a Deshaun Jackson. We saw him last week, just a few times you burn somebody deep and it's just going to save your entire fantasy day. And the fact that his late season schedule has a ton of easy matchups with Bengals, Raiders, uh, Dolphins, Redskins, like he's going to end up being a good value pick for you. And another thing I was promising, as you said, is the seven targets. He wasn't just being used as a deep threat. He was used on like trying to convert first downs and screen plays too, which I like to see. Um, like a well-rounded receiver, not just a one-dimensional guy. And I think that offense, just the fact that Sam Darnold was being pressured so much, that that might be one of like the worst weeks for that offense. And there's pretty much only, like you can only go forward from here um, in New York. Yeah, that's similar to uh, the damn Cardinals offense. After three quarters of play, they could only move forward and they did. I want to preface this by saying, I want to I actually hear what your takeaways were from the Cardinals game. Like what you thought of this offense Fourth quarter obviously looked way better than the first three quarters. But, like, I, I think I have thoughts on this, and it's maybe just me trying to defend my hate for the Cardinals at this point because I started fading them towards the fourth quarter. But I want to hear your thoughts on, on how the Cardinals game went. My, well, uh, they were obviously terrible for the first half and basically the entire third quarter and most of the fourth quarter. My thoughts and my only justification for it is, like, Carson Wentz looked awful to start the game. A couple other teams that never started their quarterback in the preseason looked awful to start the game. I think Cliff Kingsbury coming out and openly saying that they didn't use their offense in the preseason could have that similar correlation that maybe it took a little bit for them to really get on an NFL field with people playing at 100% speed. And maybe that's why it took forever for them to like really get going. That's the only thing I can understand. Because in the fourth quarter, they just flipped the switch. And that offense looked legit. They were throwing a ton. They were running a ton of plays. Um, they marched down the field twice, and they almost did it again in overtime. I just think if this offense does that again next week against Baltimore, I, I think we have to consider them a real thing. But I think it's a tough challenge next week. And um, I, I would base my opinions on this offense a little bit more maybe after week three when they get a tough defense. And then after that, I think they get like a really cake matchup in week three. Um, yeah. So well, what's funny is, you know, everyone kind of mocked Cliff Kingsbury saying we want to run 90 plays a game. They end up running 89 plays in this game. So they really did that. My thing was this, like, okay, so towards the end of the preseason, I was like, I, I don't want any part of this offense because it's looking horrible, right? And they're getting pressure up the line. And like that, on every play, it was like guys in the backfield nailing Kyler Murray or nailing David Johnson. And that was exactly what happened through three quarters of the game. If you watch the fourth quarter, the Detroit, they ran, the offense ran so many plays that the Detroit Lions passed, like their defensive line was literally just like on the snap. And then they would just get up and stand there. Like they were 
tired. They were so tired that they got no pressure into the backfield. And maybe that's, you know, props to Cliff Kingsbury for keeping it so up-tempo and making that like a long game play. But for me, it didn't look like the offense got better or the play calling got better or anything. It looked like the defense was so fucking tired from running so many plays. So what I think is going to happen is I I think Baltimore is going to absolutely crush them in week two. I think Baltimore is going to come in. I mean, they're just a better defense. They're going to come in way more uh, conditioned. Like Harbaugh is going to have them ready to go and ready to to be fucking ferocious on the defensive end. If they could play into the fourth quarter, if they could actually get some kind of pressure into the backfield on the fourth quarter, I think we're going to see a lot more success on the defensive side of the ball. And that's what it seemed like to me. I mean, they were, I mean, yeah, they were running maybe some more deep routes in the fourth quarter, but it was like, they actually gave Kyler time. And I don't think that was a a process of the offensive line getting good overnight, or I mean, over fucking one quarter to the next. It was just a product of, I swear, if any of you guys have game pass, go watch that fourth quarter, go watch the Detroit Lions defensive linemen literally get no pressure on them. However, if they're going to run this many snaps in a given game, that means there's going to be volume to go around for a lot, a lot of players. And one guy that I know you wrote down as a buy low candidate right now is Christian Kirk. Yeah. And the reason for that, okay. the reason for that is Larry Fitzgerald had such a good game and Christian Kirk in the preseason really did nothing. And he wasn't even out there that I think people are starting to think, which I don't disagree with is uh, Larry Fitzgerald is their solidified number one. And he's going to be the only one in this offense that eats. But I think the fact that he and Christian Kirk were both playing in the slot and they were both heavily targeted, like Christian Kirk had 12 targets he had 22% of the team's targets and 24% of the air yards. It's not like he's not being used in this offense. If you watch the targets he was getting and the confidence that they have in him, he had two end zone targets. One was a little bit overthrown and the other one was in double coverage. But like he was using him in the deep game. He was using him in the screen game. Um, they were scheming him open over the middle. And even at the end of the game, when they needed that two-point conversion to bring it to overtime, who did they look to in the red zone on the two-yard line for the two-point conversion? It was Christian Kirk. So I think the fact that they have that much confidence in him to use Christian Kirk in the deep game, in the red zone, uh, in the end zone, uh, the sky's the limit for him because if this offense is going to be running 70, 80 plays a game and he only gets like a 20% target share, which I don't think is unreasonable with like the lack of weapons they kind of have behind Fitzgerald, he and uh, David Johnson, he's going to have the volume to produce. And if you look at his schedule after they face uh, the Baltimore Ravens next week, It's the Panthers, the Seahawks, the Bengals, the Falcons, the Giants, the Saints, the 49ers, the Buccaneers, the 49ers, the Rams. The Steelers are a bit tough. The Browns and the Seahawks. Like every single game, I'd feel confident firing him up as a flex option, even if all we know is what we know right now. If he gets better, those games are those are going to be games you're going to start him no matter what. So I think you you have to buy him. Well, probably after next week um, against Baltimore, they're probably not going to do as well. But I think it's going to be a prime time to buy. A guy like Christian Kirk, who we were all loving this offseason. And if this offense comes to fruition, uh, I could see him being like a back-end wide receiver two, high-end wide receiver three by season's end. Yeah, I would definitely wait till after the Baltimore game because, I, like I said, I think they're probably going to struggle here. But I think the takeaway here is just like just by default. I mean, if you look at the top snap counts in the NFL at the wide receiver position in week one, of the top nine, three of them are Arizona – Two of them are Detroit on the flip side of the ball. Kenny Galladay ran the most, was on the field for the most snaps of any wide receiver in week one with 86. Then it was Fitz, Kirk, Damian Bird, all with 78 or more snaps. Then Marvin Jones is down there at 71. So this is just going to be a team that you want to target, you know, just based off pure volume. Even if, like, from my point of view, I don't think they're going to be good. Like, that's, that's not always what you need to be targeting in fantasy. Sometimes it's efficiency. Sometimes it's volume. And it looks like it could be a mix of both. But Christian Kirk is just a big play waiting to happen. He's got that 4-4 speed. He's running primarily from the slot with Larry Fitzgerald. So it's like, you know, if it's not Fitz, it's going to be Kirk. If it's not Kirk, it's going to be Fitz. And Fitz is the one coming off the big game. So obviously Kirk is the one that you could probably buy low. And I imagine Baltimore is going to come in with a ton of pressure on Kyler. And what's going to happen when – When he's under pressure, we saw what happened in week one. He's going to go to his most trusted guy, and that is Larry Fitz. So I I expect another decent PPR game out of Fitz in week two, uh, meaning Christian Kirk probably takes a back seat. But then once they fire up those ridiculously soft matchups, like you kind of mentioned for the next 10 weeks, basically, that seems like it's a go time for Kirk and the rest of this Arizona Cardinals offense. So I like that. Now, you have another wide receiver on this list, a sell-high guy that I – we'll have to strongly disagree with you on. Or go, lay out your lay out your facts. All right, it's Allen Robinson for the Chicago Bears. And this is kind of like my argument for... Fucking game? 
I did, and that's the problem, is everybody watched that game, and they saw how good he looked, and people are forgetting that Mitchell Trubisky is the guy throwing him the ball. Like, I don't care. We, he was the same situation last year. Sure, he's one more year removed from his ACL, which... It, that's big. It's he looks so yeah. fucking explosive this time around. But Mitch, I, I just can't, like, I can't pay the price or pass up on deals that you're going to get for Allen Robinson knowing that you have Mitchell Trubisky at quarterback. Like, who would you rather have for the rest of the season, Robert Woods or Allen Robinson? Robert Woods. For sure. Brandon I mean, Cooks that, or Allen Robinson? That gets closer. That gets closer for so? me. Yeah, Woods is definitely the one that I want in, in L.A. It was it was Cooks going into the season. I need to see a little bit more out of fucking Jared Goff. Because Jared Goff, you know what it is? Like, his splits when he's on the road versus at home and stuff just get real wacky. And uh, I did not like what we saw from, from Cooks in week one, obviously. I'm, I'm not, like, you know, freaking out about it. But Woods is the guy I want. Allen Robinson, though, it's just like – Look at the rest of the passing offense. Who else does he throw to? Trey Burton's hurt. Adam Sheen's not really like a downfield person. Nice in the league, Terry Cohen. Exactly. You have Terry Cohen, but he's getting targets that are like two yards away from the line of scrimmage. So the only guy getting peppered with targets down the field is Allen Robinson. And uh, I, j- I don't know. I don't see that stopping anytime soon. Even if like, you know, he's only getting 70% rate of his catchable targets. Like he looks super explosive. A guy that's making plays after the catch. A guy that can go up, even if they are erratic throws. He's one of the you know, best jumpers. He's someone that can get up and get the ball no matter how fucking far away it is because his arms are long. He jumps really high. He's super athletic. He's fast down the field. So he has a lot of different ways in order to get to balls that are erratic from Mitchell Trubisky. So I get what you're saying. Like, you don't want to buy – like, if if you can choose whether or not to buy into a wide receiver with a bad quarterback versus a good quarterback, yeah. Like, we'd like to go with a good quarterback. I just think – I don't know. I, you're right. Like, we all watched it, so we saw how good he looked. But I just feel like he looked too good in order to be like, I want to get rid of him now, you know? Yeah, I think it's the fact that a lot of people are just sending offers to try to acquire Allen Robinson because, because, like, a lot of people are hyping him up as a guy who's the second year off of his ACL, and we saw how good he was on that Thursday night game. But keep in mind, Green Bay doesn't have the best secondary, apart from, like, Adrian Amos and Jair Alexander, who wasn't shadowing him. Um, and you can get a guy like Robert Woods. I've been seeing people, like, sending me questions like, oh, should I do this trade now? I'm not sure if they're the ones proposing it. But – like, for Robert Woods or, like, a Mike Evans who people are buying low on, I know Jameis Winston isn't a good quarterback either, but we've seen him produce with a shitty quarterback, whereas Allen Robinson hasn't produced in, like, five years, and that was with Blake Bortles. So maybe I shouldn't bring that up as an example. But <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's been a long time, but it's not like Allen Robinson is, is, like, 30 years old, right? And it's like, oh, he's probably past his prime. I think coming off the second year off the ACL is a big deal because we see so many players struggle the first year off the ACL. Um, so the way I look at it is he, he looks back to form, whereas like the last year, the year prior to that, when he got hurt, it never looked like he was the old Allen Robinson. He looked a little bit sluggish. He wasn't as explosive. And in this game, it was just like, holy shit, everything thrown his way that was catchable was, was getting caught and he was breaking off big plays and shit. So, um, he just gives me a little bit like Corey Davis vibes and that's giving me a little PTSD. And I just like, he saw like 40% of target share, not that much, but like, like a 32% target share last year in Tennessee with an equally bad quarterback. And he didn't do much with it. And I'm just not sure you're going to be able to trust Allen Robinson as a wide receiver, too, for the rest of the year. But we've also seen Allen Robinson already do it. Like, Corey Davis, we're just, like, excited about him because of the draft capital. Had Corey, had Corey Davis been at the end of the first round or something, like, still the, exactly the same player if he was in exactly the same situation, but he wasn't, you know, a top whatever he was, five or six pick overall, like, we wouldn't be hanging on to Corey Davis' storyline for so long. I know a lot of people loved him coming out of school or whatever. But I, I think like AJ Brown is already the better wide receiver on Tennessee. Like I would, I would rather so have a slip on him. What's that? Not, not to like move away from Allen Robinson, but AJ Brown looked so good. AJ he, Brown looked so good. The whole, dude. all the rookie wide receivers. This was like the the fucking week of the rookie wide receivers. It was insane. He reminds me so much. I'm not sure if this is a terrible comparison, but like of Josh Gordon. Like he just looks too big, too physical for yeah. like anybody to tackle him. And in the open field, he's so elusive. He's a guy that I'm gonna try to get off the waiver wire. I know he didn't play too many snaps. But he looks to be like Marcus Mariota is one of his safer options because he can run all over the field. And Corey Davis wasn't really used all too heavily last week. And I, I don't think that's a far stretch to say that uh, A.J. Brown is their best receiver. Yeah, no. Uh, I like Brown. It's, he was also operating as a two. So it's like Corey Davis saw a lot of uh, Denzel Ward, which is obviously a tough matchup. But I think like at a point, you know, you can't just write every wide receiver off because of the matchup. Like if there are some guys, like I talk about Robbie Anderson against Tredavious White. Like Robbie Anderson is not the – the pure, like, thoroughbred wide receiver that's going to beat elite cornerbacks. So that has to be cushioned into his, you know, trade capital, his trade target, you know, availability and stuff. 
But when you're a guy like Corey Davis, who has top five capital, like you're, you should be expected to beat these number one cornerbacks. And if you can't do that, then you're obviously not the high end wide receiver one that a lot of teams or people expected you to be. So AJ Brown is going to continue to get the easier matchups until, you know, they'll play the Patriots and the Patriots are smart on defense. So they'll put their primary targets onto AJ Brown and leave Corey Davis open to, to run him up probably. But for the rest of the teams, they're going to um, throw down on Corey Davis and leave AJ Brown open. Now, if you're, if you're putting your waiver wire money down on one of these rookie wide receivers, we have AJ Brown, we have Hollywood Brown, we have Terry McLaurin, uh, we have – well, what other rookie wide receivers? Uh, Metcalf is probably too high owned, I'd say, right? Metcalf, um, Miko Hardman, now with Tyree Kill out. So there's like five or six legitimate rookie wide receivers. Uh, well, John Ross is not a rookie wide receiver, but he's a young wide receiver that semi-finally had like a decent game. Um, there's a lot of young wide receivers like to target here. Now, there's always like a storyline, you know, you don't want to target rookie wide receivers because they take long to kind of break into their zone. But it seems like this class is going to make a difference right away. And it's a lot of these speed guys who are making plays down the field. And we're seeing more passing yardage, more receiving yardage um, than ever before. And I think, like, I don't think these are very fluky perform. I mean, some of them are fluky. When you look at, like, Hollywood Brown played on fucking 14 snaps, right, and broke off two big ones against the Dolphins, that is something that I see as fluky. Do I think the performance dictates that he's going to have more work moving forward? Yeah, Absolutely. But do I think that he goes from an 18% snap guy up to a 90% snap guy? No. Where on the flip side, Terry McLaurin of the Redskins, you might look at him and be like, oh, this was a fluky performance. He caught a long ball. But he was on the field for 93% of the snaps. When they were in two wide receiver sets, it was Terry McLaurin. It was Paul Richardson. Now they're without Darius Geis. Yeah, AP slips in. But they might go a little bit away from the run game and go and continue to go more pass heavy, which is better for Terry McLaurin. The guy could have easily went over 200 yards if Case McKeenum didn't fucking overthrow him on a 70-yard bomb. So – when I'm looking at Terry McLaurin, bro, I like Terry McLaurin a lot. He's someone that I will probably be targeting. He might be my top rookie target this um, in this waiver wire run that I think will probably sur- surprise a lot of people. Yeah, when we were talking about wide receivers early this offseason, the rookies specifically, he wasn't the guy I was too high on. And I think it's just the fact that he was on the same team as uh, – he was on Ohio State with Paris Campbell, and I was a little bit higher on Paris Campbell. But in the offseason, I started watching a little bit more of his uh, highlights after – or not highlights, but, like, also game film after there was a lot of positive buzz about him in Washington Redskins camp. And they got He's, like, a really good receiver in all aspects of the game. And I saw on Twitter people were talking about how Ohio State maybe kind of undervalues or underutilizes, like, prototypical receivers instead of, like, a Michael Thomas or even a Terry McLaurin in favor of, like, a Paris Campbell or Curtis Samuel. And I think that's – to, like kind of true because you see how Terry McLaurin looked in his first ever NFL game and he just beat the defense deep twice um, the other one that was overthrown he had like five to ten yards of separation it wasn't even close it was just a bad ball and I think he was out there 93 percent of the time and he got a decent chunk of targets I think it was either five or seven targets but um, he's a guy I'm buying in on because he could easily slot into that number one receiver chair there and I know that's the same for Mar- uh, Marquise Brown uh, Hollywood Brown but I just don't see the Ravens ever throwing as much. Well, they only threw 20 times, but I don't see them ever being in as favorable of a matchup as playing uh, Miami again, where that team just didn't want to cover anybody. And he broke off like his first touchdown. He just broke an arm tackle where they had no safety help over top. And he just ran into the end zone and he only played like eight pass snaps. So I, I, again, I don't see him playing like an 80% snap share. So I would take McLaurin. And if we're lumping in DK Metcalf into this group, I just think he's way too big, way too physical, and he matches up with Russell Wilson's skill set way too perfectly for him to be a guy who's going to bust because he looked he looked like a man amongst boys out there, and he was just bodying cornerbacks. It was, it was a it sight was to see. It was uh, – I, I was like, dude, how – like, I thought Lockett was going to be bust-proof. And, I mean, he ended up catching that 45-yard touchdown pass, so he came away like, okay, you weren't killed as a fantasy owner, but one fucking target. DK was the only – wide receiver on the Seahawks to notch a target prior to the fourth quarter of the game, which is insane. But after the game, they were talking to Tyler Lockett, and he was saying that he kept receiving um, double coverage. Devin Booker every- treatment, double cover him. Double, they just double covered him, took him out of the game. He was saying, he's like, yeah, I haven't had that in years since back in college, back in high school. Like, I haven't had double coverage. And obviously he hasn't had that because he had, like, Doug Baldwin or other weapons on the team where he didn't need to. And now he's the number one, so he's seeing this – uh, this double coverage and that kind of has me a little bit worried as a as a guy who I mean I didn't get him in that many places but he was definitely someone I wanted to get and I told a lot of people to draft now I'm not freaking out obviously because I think you know they'll be able to adjust and 
Um, their game plan was clearly to go in and run the ball down the throats of the Cincinnati Bengals, and the Bengals held up pretty well compared to what I thought they would do. Um, but overall, I mean, it was it was what Russell Wilson, we thought it was going to be, where he threw the ball, what, 20, 22 times or whatever in this game. It's like, shit, if that's really going to be it going forward. And he needs to be split. I think we'll see probably a near even target split maybe going forward between Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. But, man, Metcalf did look really, 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 really good. And he couldn't have landed in a better situation. I know we both, like, none of us really liked him here as a prospect coming out just because there were so many – there was the injury concerns. And he's already dealt with a bunch of different things he banged up in the summer – but there was a the fact that like he didn't run a lot of routes, but it's like he lands in the Seahawks and we all kind of changed our tune and we're like, you know, if there's somewhere he's going to go, it's to Russell Wilson, one of the most efficient, accurate downfield throwers, which Mac matches Metcalf's skill set because we don't need him to be running posts. I mean, we don't need him to be running slants and, you know, over the middles and shit like that. Just get down the field and make a play over these five foot ten cornerbacks. And that's what we saw a lot of. So Metcalf's definitely a guy that uh, I don't think that was a fluky performance. But some of these other, I mean, there's just so many good options on the waiver wire and we actually just had breaking news come in right now oh no Peyton uh, it's nothing crazy Patriots are trading wide receiver Demarius Thomas in division to the New York Jets for a 2021 sixth round pick so, so they just Jets, got an older version of Quincy Nuna that's pretty good I guess exactly what they just got um now Demarius Thomas like I'm, I, I'm shocked that they just took a flyer on him I mean the Patriots obviously when they originally signed him that was all it was was a flyer maybe a veteran presence or something like that in the locker room because they really had no one there you know Rob Gronkowski was leaving all they had left was Julian Edelman in the locker room but like Demarius Thomas, he had that, like, I, people were going nuts about the fourth quarter preseason game or the fourth preseason game that he had where he caught, like, 77 yards with the balls and two touchdowns. But, like, if, I was following all the doctors on Twitter, and they're all just like, yeah, you could tell he wasn't planting hard. He couldn't even jump off the ground or whatever. So he's clearly not back. I mean, he suffered the Achilles injury last year. And, uh, I mean, we saw Emmanuel Sanders come back and looks perfect, which is mind-blowing. But Demarius Thomas, I don't know. He just seems like he's someone who relies too much on his – like physical traits in terms of like speed and explosiveness. Um, and he's not like crafty enough to win on most parts of the field. So I don't, I, like, I'm not really de- looking at anything when it comes to Demarius Thomas, like what impact he's going to have on the Jets. Yeah. I don't, I think it's kind of redundant, but like a worse skill set than Robbie Anderson at this point in his career, because I'm not sure that Demarius Thomas can turn left and right anymore. Um, whereas Robbie Anderson can, and we just talked about DK Metcalf. So it's a little correlation there, but yeah, he's what was a fourth round pick. You said, Six round. Six. Oh, yeah. That, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. That's basically a throwaway because whoever the Jets picked there anyways wouldn't have been any good. It could have been a fourth round or a third round. It was still going to end up fucking busting. You know, you know what it was? The Patriots got Tom Brady in the sixth round and Antonio Brown was a sixth round pick. So maybe they think that they have like a little inside info on who to choose and like pick 300. So that was just a light flex. They're like, yeah, we're going to give you, they probably <laughs> were on the phone like, hey, we're going to give you Antonio Brown for Demarius Thomas. And they're like, but it's just a six round pick. It's not actually. Tom Brady or Antonio Brown and Jets were like fuck we've yeah. already hit we'll choose KJ Costello and he'll be like the next fucking <laughs> like Jimmy Garoppolo and we'll trade him for something yeah so we're not buying into anything that's relevant to Demarius Thomas maybe it's, uh, also like I said a, a locker room presence because you look at the wide receivers there and most of them are a, a few years into the league they don't really have a true veteran presence who's been there who's been through the playoffs who's done it before he could probably help out Sam Darnold as much as any of these guys in the room because Herndon's young, Jameson Crowder's relatively young, Robbie Anderson is young, Quincy Nunwa. I mean, they're all they're all young. They don't have any really real veterans in that wide receiver group. So um, that I mean, if I'm looking at it, they're just hoping that maybe Demarius Thomas can get back to health quicker rather than later. But I don't know. Fuck that. To be honest, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know why I brought that up. I'm breaking yeah, it. there's only like there's very few parts of this Jets offense I want to buy in on. Um, even like Jamison Crowder, I'm not sure he's going to put up like 250 targets this year. So, I mean, he will. Yeah, actually, he as, might. <laughs> Chris, yeah, as long as Chris Herndon's out, he should be eating for the first four weeks or whatever. But I believe that's all we have for y'all today. So, again, every Wednesday we'll be doing a trade targets video. If you want the waiver wire article, that is up on Patreon, patreon.com slash BDGE. A lot of the analysis that we'll do over the first couple of days following the week that just happened will be on Twitter. Um, we tweet out a lot of stats that we find, a lot of the research that we do for the waiver wire article, as well as these videos, you will find that on Twitter. So make sure you're following Noah at FB God, myself at Nick underscore B D G E thumbs up. If you enjoyed the video, comment down below. If you have any sit star questions or trade questions or whatever, subscribe to the channel. If you're new tomorrow, we will be on with Dr. Morse talking about the injury report for week two. Lots of injuries as always football is bike. We bike. It's a beautiful out. It's a beautiful thing. Later.